Um, at this time, I want to introduce our guest speaker. Um, Elizabeth Logue has been a member of Chestnut Hill United for over 16 years. Um, we got to know each other a little bit better when we went to, on a trip to the Arizona-Mexico border. That was a really special bonding occasion for several members of the church. Um, Beth is a retired school teacher, and she is also our liaison for POWER. POWER is, stands for People Organized to Witness, Empower, and Rebuild. And Beth um, is particularly involved in two of their campaigns, their education ca campaign and now their civic engagement campaign. And she's been so enthusiastic and passionate about it that um, she said, can you do a sermon to get people riled up about vote, voter registration and all these things? And I said, how about you do it, Beth? <laughs> and she kindly agreed. So we are so very excited to be able to hear from Beth in a different way this Sunday. Um, so Beth, thanks for being with us. Okay, testing, does that work? Okay. Good morning, everybody. John Lewis, the civil rights and con con uh, leader and congressman from Georgia who died on July 17, 2020, wrote this essay shortly before his death. It was published in the New York Times on July 30, 2020. Together, you can redeem the soul of our nation. Though I am gone, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. While my time here has now come to an end, I want you to know that in the last days and hours of my life, you inspired me. You filled me with hope about the next chapter of the great American story when you used your power to make a difference in our society. Millions of people motivated simply by human compassion laid down the burdens of division. Around the country and the world, you set aside race, class, age, language, and nationality to demand respect for human dignity. This is why I had to visit Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington, though I was admitted to the hospital the following day. I just had to see and feel it for myself that after many years of silent witness, the truth is still marching on. Emmett Till was my George Floyd. He was my Rayshard Brooks, Sandra Bland, and Breonna Taylor. He was 14 when he was killed, and I was only 15 years old at the time. I will never, ever forget the moment when it became so clear that he could easily have been me. In those days, fear constrained us like an imaginary prison, and troubling thoughts of potential brutality committed for no understandable reason were the bars. Though I was surrounded by two loving parents, plenty of brothers and sisters and cousins, their love could not protect me from the unholy oppression waiting just outside that family circle. Unchecked, unrestrained violence and government-sanctioned terror had the power to turn a simple stroll to the store for some Skittles or an innocent morning jog down a lonesome country road into a nightmare. If we are to survive as one unified nation, we must discover what so readily takes root in our hearts that could rob Mother Emanuel Church in South Carolina of her brightest and best, shoot unwitting concertgoers in Las Vegas, and choke to death the hopes and dreams of a gifted violinist like Elijah McLean. Like so many young people today, I was searching for a way out, or some might say a way in, and then I heard the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on an old radio. He was talking about the philosophy and discipline of nonviolence. He said, we are all complicit when we tolerate injustice. He said, it is not enough to say it will get better by and by. He said, each of us has a moral obligation to stand up, speak up, and speak out. 
When you see something that is not right, you must say something. You must do something. Democracy is not a state. It is an act, and each generation must do its part to help build what we call the beloved community, a nation and world society at peace with itself. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. <clears throat> Voting and participating in the de democratic process are key. The vote is the most powerful, nonviolent change you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. You must also study and learn the lessons of history because humanity has been involved in this soul-wrenching existential struggle for a very long time. People on every continent have stood in your shoes through decades and centuries before you. The truth does not change, and that is why the answers worked out long ago can help you find solutions to the challenges of our time. Continue to build union between movements stretching across the globe because we must put away our willingness to profit from the exploitation of others. Though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love, and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. When historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting Love be your guide. The scripture reading today is 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. Dealing with false teachers. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have, depended, who have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. <clears throat> the Lord knows those who are his, <clears throat> and <clears throat> everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. John Lewis said, the vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. And now it is your turn to let freedom ring. But we're busy. I'm busy, you're busy, especially if you have school-aged children or an elderly parent or a stressful job. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to invest just two hours from your busy life to be a change agent, to let freedom ring. These three things I know are true. Number one, I now read far less novels and far more news than I used to. Number two, I am unhappy with the current state of politics in this country. Number three, I hate making phone calls. Concerning number one, I now read far less novels and far more news than I used to. Every morning, I start my day reading, sometimes at 3 a.m. due to insomnia, with historian 
Heather Cox Richardson's newsletter, which puts the news of the day in a historical perspective. There have been worse times politically, like the Civil War. But today's news is much more meaningful to me, so I read it carefully. When I wake up after my second go-round at about 6 a.m., I read the Philadelphia Inquirer to find out what's going on in the city, and the New York Times summary, because at the end of that, I can do the mini crossword and Wordle as a reward and a mind break. While I get dressed, I listen to NPR. By the time I'm done, there is no time for light reading. I'd like to cut down on the news time, but feel so anxious about the constant stream of sensational stories that are affecting my life that I can't help wanting to know every detail so that I can be well informed and have good counter arguments for those with different perspectives from me. My counter arguments aren't really working. So I try to stay close to friends who think like I do and just discuss the weather with those who don't. However, I do know that I need to do more. Concerning number two, I am unhappy with the current state of politics in this country. In the past, I was aware of what was happening in the country, stayed abreast of the news, and was disappointed if my candidate did not win. But I never felt that my rights were threatened in a major way or that there were dire consequences to having any one particular person or party in power. Last year, just one senator's vote had a major impact on the lives of, lives of millions of poor children. Under the American Rescue Plan of 2021, the child tax credit, a monthly payment to families, was expanded from $2,000 to $3,000 to $3,600 per child, cutting child poverty by 30%. Parents spent the cash on basic needs. One senator's vote in 2022 did away with that credit, and it hasn't returned. As coordinator of the English Language Learner Program at Alney Charter High School in North Philadelphia, I worked with students in poverty and saw what they did without. One family had no mattresses to sleep, sleep on, and all the kids were sleeping on the hard floor without carpet. My oldest son and I drove in a van around to a number of houses of my friends and acquaintances to pick up donated mattresses and deliver them to this family. Another family did not have sufficient food to get through a long weekend. When I took them shopping for food on my own dime, the teenage girls asked if they could buy sanitary products. One family who canceled their cable service had to return their box to Verizon so they wouldn't continue to be charged but there was no store close to their neighborhood, and they had no car. It would take multiple buses and great expense to get there. I had the student bring the box to school, and I returned it to the Verizon store that was in my rich neighborhood. I tell you this not to make myself look like a hero, but to share the very mundane and uncomfortable situations poor people find themselves in when they have few resources. Imagine what that child tax credit could have gotten them. Not a big screen TV or gaming system, as some politicians might claim, but a good night's rest. A full belly so that they could concentrate on their studies. Sanitary products so the girls could come to school during their periods. And cable service. One vote has prevented millions of families from meeting very basic needs for mattresses, food, sanitary products, and cable. Child poverty has gone back to previous levels. 16% of all kids nationwide, or 11.6 million children, still live in poverty. Imagine if everyone who cared about ending child poverty voted for candidates who also cared about ending child poverty. This is the United States. We are the most powerful country in the world with checks and balances, right? This is no longer true, and I am truly terrified about what my family will do if the Pennsylvania legislature deems my gay son unwelcome in this state. I've actually applied for my Irish citizenship because my grandparents were born there, and I can do that. I recently read that Google reported a very high number of people from the US researching how to become a citizen of another country. 
Maybe I will be able to provide a safe haven for my son for part of the year in Ireland. Maybe he will have to move to another state. Regardless, our lives will be inalterably disrupted in a way that was unimaginable just over six years ago. Concerning number three, I hate making phone calls. Although I truly hate the thought of making repeated calls to strangers to ask them to go vote, I do believe it is one of the most effective ways to get out the vote. Kansas just had a record turnout for a midterm election where people were asked to answer a very important question about how much control the state should have over women's bodies. I don't know for sure how they got their large turnout, which came mainly from the increased registration of women and young voters, but I am willing to bet that phone calls played a big part. And so, here's my ask of you. Power Interfaith is devoting the fall months up until the election to organizing phone banks in many congregations throughout the city. Our Northwest cluster is pooling resources to set up voter registration tables at various community activities. We need people who care about the future of our democracy, who believe that the state should not be controlling our bodies and who, are allow and, and who we are allowed to marry, who want children to rise out of poverty, and who want to stop obsessing over the news every day and worrying about what freedoms we are about to lose. We need to vote like our lives depended on it and like other people's lives depend on it and get people to vote. I am asking you to invest a small amount of your time to make phone calls no matter how much you hate it. <laughs> Just two hours. Our date is Thursday, October 13th from 12 to 2 or from 6.30 to 8.30. The sign up link is in the bulletin and on our website. You can participate either in person or via Zoom. You can also join another congregation if you can't make the night our church does our phone bank. It is a great opportunity to coalesce for a common cause, to be a change agent, to let freedom ring. And we will make it as fun as possible. Maybe brownies and chocolate chip cookies will be involved. <laughs> Why, as people of faith, should we do this? Power is organizing a three-week bus tour where clergy will travel to different parts of the state with the aim of providing a, providing a counterexample to the white Christian nationalism that's the most vi visible type of Christianity these days. The type of voter engagement Power and I are asking you to participate in seems like it offers a different version of faithful activism in the world. To quote John Lewis again, Nothing can stop the power of a committed and determined people to make a difference in our society. Why? Because, the hum because human beings are the most dynamic link to the divine on this planet. Here are three, thi three things I want to be true. Number one, I want to get back to reading more novels and less news. Number two, I do not want to worry anymore about what rights might be taken away from my family, my friends, or my fellow Americans. Number three, once the election is over, I only want to speak on the phone to my friends and family and very occasionally to a customer service rep. Amen. <laughs>